So yeah, um, today I want to talk about some recent work Rafe and I have been doing uh, on doing 2D graphics and application like GUI application development in Rust. Uh, this talk is going to be in about three and a half parts. Uh, first, we're going to do kind of the standard rush, rough Rust evangelism section, where I try and convince you all to try Rust for whatever you're next trying anything for. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about the specific tools that have been built. And then Rafe is going to talk briefly about uh, some exciting new like, rendering strategies he has. Uh, and hopefully we'll have time for a demo. I really like Rust. This is kind of like one of the many little like short, punchy Rust promo bits. And I'm going to try and go through these piecewise. Um, fast, reliable, and productive. We'll start with fast. So I want to clarify quickly. When we talk about fast, we're talking about, um, we're talking about like runtime fast. Rust generates fast code. It generates fast binaries. Um, oh, yeah, so I'm doing this thing again where I'm looking at the next slide section, not the current slide section. Uh, and this is important in application development. It's important like, if you want to be avoiding like, UI lagginess. It's important because it frees you up. It, it gives you those resources to create better experiences and to like, do more with the user, for the user. Uh, Rust is also fast in the sense that it gives you really direct C-level access to hardware, to system-level APIs. This is in contrast with something like Go or Java, where you have kind of like mediating layers that are sort of trying to provide access to those services for you. Um, and then Rust is also fast in kind of this slightly harder to explain way. Um, but Rust makes a lot of things harder but they're things you probably didn't want to do. So one of the examples of this is there's a, famously there's a sign at Mozilla in the Mozilla San Francisco office that says, must be this tall to write multi-threaded code, and the sign is about nine feet up in the sky. Uh, and the reason that multi-threaded code is hard to write is that sharing state across threads safely is very hard to do, and it's just a common source of bugs. Uh, one of the things that Rust does is it makes it so that you have to basically jump through some hoops to guarantee to the compiler that when you are sharing state across threads, you're doing it in a way that is, is safe. Things are behind mutexes. Things are like you're using atomics. I won't get too into the weeds. But it's, it allows you to then do aggressive multi-threaded things with these guarantees. Um, and one of the most popular or one of the most famous current Rust projects is RIPGREC, which is a, grip, a, a grep replacement that's very, very fast. And most of its speed wins over grep or over other grep-like tools come from its ability to exploit the fact that like modern hardware has lots of cores. Um, and even some of it still has hyper-threading enabled. So. Um, and then I want to talk about the reliability. A big part of the reliability, and the thing I'm going to focus on, and the thing that most people maybe know about Rust or are scared of about Rust, is this idea of ownership. Uh, and what this means is that in Rust, so Rust has no garbage collection. We talked about that earlier. Um, but it also affords you like C-level performance, though you having to write a bunch of like malloc and free stuff. You're not manually managing that. Manually managing memory. Uh, and the way that that happens is you have this idea of ownership, where some piece of memory is owned by some function or some scope within a function. And when it goes out of scope, it's free. Um, and so basically, there, anyway, there's a continuation of this, is that there's also enforced exclusivity so I want to like look through. Here's a little bit of sample code. This is this is Rust code. Uh, this is a, an example of a bug I've written before in other languages, where I have a mutable collection. Here I've got a little vector, and I'm going to iterate through that vector. And then somewhere inside my iteration, I'm going to change the vector I'm trying to iterate through. And this will probably seg fault in like C++ because you're going to have out of bounds, or you're going to otherwise you're going to have some access error. And if I try and compile this in Rust, I get this where the compiler can tell that I am trying to mutably access this thing that I have an outstanding reference to, and it will just not let me run this program. Um, and this is just a really, like, really conceptually powerful. It just saves you from whole classes of bugs. And in general, ownership, and here I'm kind of, I'm lumping in a bunch of other language features that Rust provides, like bounds checking and things, but ownership prevents like large squads of memory errors. There was an audit in Firefox of like their last hundred odd like critical CDEs, like critical security 
vulnerabilities, and about 72 of them would have been impossible to write in Rust. The others, still possible, but 72 is good. Uh, yeah, dangling pointers and use after free, that's stuff that ownership handles. There's also things like preventing buffer overflows, null pointer to referencing. These are all things for, you know, you have to really go out of your way to write these bugs. You still can if you want to, but you have to, like, try. And kind of the takeaway for this, to me, is that sort of by encoding a lot of this, like, lifetime stuff in the type system, you let the compiler keep track of things that otherwise the programmer would have to keep track of. So if anybody's worked on like big C or C++ projects, a lot of your mental state becomes, or a lot of your mental space is taken up with the state of keeping track of like who owns what memory. And the kind of the concept of Rust is that like, let's just tell the compiler who owns what memory and it can keep track of that for us and we can worry about like what our program is supposed to be doing. And I want to talk a little bit about the productive stuff. This is really the more fun stuff. And that Rust gives you this, all this low-level performancey things, but it also gives you a lot of language features that feel like a much higher-level language. Um, I don't mean the feel is right, but it, it provides high-level abstractions. And importantly, it provides these abstractions that still produce this fast C-ish code. I'm going to go through a couple of these. A really big one is the trait system. Traits are like interfaces in Java or protocols in Swift. Uh, they describe some set of behavior. And here's a concrete example. Here is a shape trait. And so, this is basically just an abstract platonic idea of shapeness. What does a shape have? Well, it's got some area. It like encloses some area. It has a perimeter. It has a bounding box, which is like the, you know, the smallest rectangle that can enclose all of its points. Uh, it has up here at the top, this is sort of an implementation thing, but it has this ability to be turned into a path, so you can draw it. And uh, why don't we walk through kind of what that would look concretely. So, a circle is a very simple shape. It has a center and it has a radius. And so if we implement the shape trait for circle, this is all like real Rust code. Uh, spoiler, it's actually, this is in production-ish, production is. Yeah. Um, and here's like my grade school geometry, the like radius is pi, like pi r squared, and perimeter is two pi r. Uh, and so what this gives us is a way to work with Rust's really powerful generic system. So we can write functions like this, uh, where this is a function fill that takes as an argument anything that implements this shape trait. And importantly, like, uh, this isn't doing like dynamic dispatch or anything. But here, so here, here we can take, we can create a circle, and we can call this fill method with it. And it will just fill that circle because the circle knows its area and the circle can like hit test itself and tell you what pixels should be filled. Um, we can also take, also I should mention this canvas thing is just some arbitrary like drawing context. It could be implemented for like WebGL or it could be implemented for uh, GTK on a like, backpipe or on Vulkan or something. It's just like an abstraction, another abstraction for the thing that you're drawing to. Uh, so here we can like make a circle and we can pass it to this call for this function, this, this method. We can make a rectangle, pass it to that same method. And so this is what it looks like to us writing it. And it's important that, or like the thing to note is that we're not having to write like fill rect and fill circle and have give them like these special quick implementations that take advantage of the particular properties of the particular shapes. And then this is kind of what the compiler does for us, is it actually knows that these, these shapes things actually have concrete implementations and it can go and at compile time, generate code that is specific and is fast for each given shape, and do all that for us. Uh, I think the the you know the million dollar word is uh, monomorphization, compile time monomorphization, uh, and so we get this stuff. That's kind of like if we were writing the fast code, we'd have to write this by hand traditionally. And I mean, it's kind of like C plus plus templating is similar. There's other thing. Get to that in a sec. Um, but this basically gives us the fast code generation without the like burdensome having to write it all by hand. And then another abstraction Rust provides is an interesting example. It's kind of like a grab bit. There's lots of these, but I just want to touch on a couple. Is iterator. And so iterator is a trait that comes, it's built in, it's like part of the standard library. And an iterator is kind of like a generator in Python. It's some entity that you can call repeatedly and it will produce values. And uh, so I was a little deceptive earlier when I showed you this little part of shape, and that shape 
Here in this thing I showed you, it's returning a, like a Bezier path, which you would assume is some object that has like some collection of elements or something, and it's probably a keep allocated. Uh, you can probably move it around. Actually, this code really looks like this. And this is like maybe a little hairy, but it's not so bad. What this says is that when you define shape for circle, say, you also have to say that you provide with it some thing that implements iterator. And instead of returning a Bezier path, you return this iterator. And so here, for circle, we can imagine there's some struct, just like the circle path iterator. And when we equal shape for circle, we say that that's the type of this thing, and that's what we return. We can do the same for rect. And then so here I want to look at concretely, because this is, comes to kind of the crux of those sort of abstractions that Rust provides and the way that it's a good choice if you're currently thinking about something like C++, is um, this iterator struct just has a copy of our current rect, and our rect is just four sides, and it has an index, which is what step of iteration we're at. And then when we actually go to use this, all we're doing is we call this next function here repeatedly until it returns none, and those are, it's returning like drawing instructions in the classic like postscript sense. Uh, and so all we do is we increment our internal counter, and then for each sort of whatever our current step is, we say either like it's the first step, it's like, oh, move to our first point. And then we just, you know, for four line segments, tell you to draw four lines. And then when we're done, we're done. And really importantly, this never allocates. This is going to compile, compile down to like some kind of like branch some, like some nested so like a big if else. And like anytime you've used a GUI application and like you've been dragging something and your cursor is stuttered, the reason it's done that probably is because you were, like something was getting allocated under the covers. There are other things, other like reasons that could happen, but that's a very, very common one. And so the ability to do things like this with just, like zero allocations is actually really powerful if you're doing low level graphics programming. And, and the fact that like, the fact that I can fit this entire implementation of something that is kind of pretty wheezy on a slide in like 50 odd point type is like pretty, it feels good to me. It doesn't feel good to you. Uh, we'll talk later. So yeah, this is really the big takeaway is that things like iterator and the trig system let us write these high level feeling things that compile down to really fast low level C. There's a last thing I wanted to add, actually, about list of three, and this is like very subjective, but I feel it's really important. And it's that I kind of like started writing Rust by accident about three years ago now, maybe two and a half, uh, and it's just been really fun. I really enjoyed myself. A large part of that is that the language itself, that's like there's excellent tooling, things are easy to build, things are easy to write and run unit tests, little things like that. Uh, it's easy to like manage dependencies. But it also is really interesting in the way that the language kind of gets out of your way and lets you like work on, um, work on like focusing on like de designing your program and solving the problems that you're trying to solve, and less on like wrestling with your tooling. And another big, big part of it is the community. And Rust, kind of importantly, there's no like emperor figure. Everything is run through working groups. All design decisions are go through like a RFC, like a request for comments process. Um, language changes are largely consensus, or like certainly consensus of within a working group. Uh, and there's just like a real thoughtfulness and care that uh, is has been taken towards building a community. And it's really one of the warmest open source spaces I've been around, and. I don't know, it just is, is absolutely uh, a plus, like a, a thing that I, I can't, I, don't know, I can't touch on that enough, but it is really a part of the reason I enjoy the language. So, I guess now we should actually talk more concretely about the stuff that's been working on now. Uh, Pete is a new, so Crate is a library in Rust Lang, but these are four libraries. Um, Pete is a 2D graphics abstraction layer. That is, it provides this simple API where you have like a render context, which is something that draws things, and then that can be implemented by various backends. Kerbo uh, provides 
like descriptions and implementations for shapes and vectors and curves. Uh, a lot of the definitions earlier, like that shape trait, are part of Kerbo. Uh, and sort of like it gets used by Pete Scribo is for like um, text layout and font resolution and like kind of low level weedsy type stuff. And then Druid is a 2D, well, no, Druid is a cross platform GUI toolkit for like doing application development. And realistically, this graph actually, in terms of dependencies, looks more like this, where Druid is this thing that's being built, and Pete is this like backing layer that provides the drawing abstractions. And then these other two are kind of like provide like lower level like type definitions and implementations for things that you need if you're doing 2D graphics. And importantly, it's all cross-platform. And so Peak defines a general set of traits that are implemented for a given target platform. Uh, currently, these are there are there are backends for these three platforms. We have like a Cairo backend, Direct 2D for Windows, and then a web backend, I think. Wraith can touch on that. I think it's using the Canvas API. Yes. Uh, and then Wraith has actually been recently working on something new that he'll talk about shortly, um, which is metal, and I couldn't help myself with the, uh, yeah. So maybe Rafe will talk about that for a yeah. few minutes? Absolutely. Thanks, Colin. That was great. Um, so heat metal. <laughs> heat metal is an experimental GPU render. It's really, at this point, it's really still a research uh, prototype, but I think it has some really interesting uh, features that I'd like to talk about. It's really about being fast. That is the primary goal. And uh, I also wanted to kind of build it to be easier to fine tune, especially like uh, for quality of not taking shortcuts. A lot of renders, you have limited compute resource, so you don't get things like gamma correction uh, right. So, and I think the other uh, part of the feed metal design is to really move almost all of the processing off of the CPU and have all of the processing of the vector data and the rendering into pixels done by the GPU because there's so much more compute power available there. And as a research question, I was really trying to, you know, there's, it's obvious that we have to move to the GPU to get performance as you get higher resolution screens and faster frame rates. And is the traditional 2D API the kind of programming that we've been doing with PostScript and, you know, uh, Cairo and, and Web Canvas, is that still a valid programming model for building these uh, user interfaces, or should we be writing UI that builds triangle strips and writes shaders to, to generate those um, uh, generate those uh, GUIs in a language that the GPU kind of understands more natively? And I think that it's still early days with the prototype, but I think I have satisfied myself that yes, you can implement the traditional 2D graphics engine model on the GPU and I'll just touch very lightly on, on how that's going to work. And so part of the magic of Peat Metal is that it's doing all of its work in compute shaders. Traditional GPU techniques are based on rasterization, and that's not how Peat Metal works. And so there's a first compute shader. It's a pipeline of two passes. And the first one takes the vector image and splits it into tiles. And then the second one takes those tiles and renders them into pixels. So if you start with a, some of you might recognize this image. Um, and uh, so you're going to divide it, uh, you know, typical, typical um, uh, 2D vector image. Uh, and you're going to divide it into tiles. And then for each one of those tiles, that's going to have a number of elements in it. And it's going to take uh, those elements, it's going to analyze that source image, and it's going to create a command list. So these are the basically the operations that have to be done uh, within that tile only. So all of the other elements that are not in that tile you can reject uh, while you're generating the command list for this tile. And then in the second uh, half of the pipeline, you're going to execute that command list for each of those pixels in parallel, which is something that GPUs can do really, really well. So, as I say, this is still a research prototype, but the results so far are very promising. Like, the, uh, that tiger 
on a high resolution display, I'm rendering entirely on the GPU in about 2.7 milliseconds on this uh, MacBook Pro hardware, which I think is really encouraging. Like this is going to enable, the hope is that this will enable very rich graphical applications where you're not limited in the number of layers or the number of objects uh, and you're still able to maintain a very fluid uh, um, kind of 60 frames a second um, interactivity, you know, this kind of feedback loop where the artist can be immediately seeing the results of the editing. So uh, we've talked about this infrastructure that we've been building and now um, I think uh, it would be a good time to move to what are we building on top of that infrastructure. And I think uh, Colin can give it a little demo. <coughs> Hopefully. So yeah, um, for the last little while, Rafe and I have been talking about a font editor. And so about a week ago, I started playing around, I mean, it took me a week before that to write something with parse UFO files. Uh, but about a week ago, I started playing around with Druid to see how it would work. And so here we have a very, like, simple little toy editor that will open up, a, a, like, a layer of glyphs. We can come in and look at these. We can, like, do terrible things. Um... We can do whatever we like. We can't save, which is a blessing because I'm not a designer. Uh, and yeah, so this has been a very much just an exploration of prototyping and playing around. But it's felt very good. It, it makes me confident that, certainly for things like a drawing tool that isn't using a lot of like system UI, that this is definitely an approach that will produce results. Uh, I want to show you one little thing, which is, um, I know there's probably like a lot of non-graphic designers here, but uh, this is how you make italics. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much.